Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me there at the back? Just making sure the, I'm audible. Um, it's good to see so many of you here. I, as Fawn said, I'm Jason Cowley, editor of the New Statesman. When we announced that we were having this debate, we put, we put it up on our website, and I think within a matter of hours, we'd sold all of our tickets, seven, 800 tickets within a matter of hours. We thought about switching venue. We had a long waiting list of people wanting to come here this evening. In the end, we stayed where we are here at Kensington Town Hall, and I think it's a fine venue. The motion before the House this evening is this House believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place. The subject of the debate is to coincide with a special issue of the New Statesman on freedom of information, which is guest edited by the human rights activist and journalist Jemima Khan. And I'm pleased to say she's here this evening with us. And this has been something of a media sensation. So um, congratulations, Jemima, on, on a fantastic issue of the New Statesman. I know you don't want to hear me speak, so I'm going to introduce the speakers very soon, but a few brief words about the format. Each speaker will have no more than seven minutes to make his case. I shall encourage interactions between the speakers, interjections in the form of points of information in the style of a classic Oxford Union debate. So without further ado, may I introduce the team which will be proposing the motion. Could you step forward, Clayton Swisher? Julian Assange. I gather you, some of you must recognize that gentleman. Mehdi Hassan. Opposing the motion, we have Sir David Richards. We have Bob Ayres. And we have Douglas Murray. No heckling yet, please. I'll say a few brief um, words about each, each of our speakers. Clayton Swisher has a wonderful title. It's, it's your head of Al Jazeera's transparency unit. He's the man who brought you the Palestine Papers, which were a media sensation in January 2011. <laughs> our second speaker proposing the motion really needs no introduction, but I shall try all the same. Um, Julian Assange was born in Queensland, Australia. He's editor-in-chief of WikiLeaks, organization that, that I, in my opinion, has changed the direction of world history. Julian has probably facilitated more acts of whistleblowing than any other individual. Leading American politicians have called for his assassination, and he's continuing subject of an ongoing espionage investigation. In this week's issue of the New Statesman, Julian has written an article in which he describes, I think, in a resonant phrase, at, as he calls WikiLeaks the intelligence agency of the people. I think that's a rather nice phrase. The final speaker proposing the motion is Mehdi Hassan, who works for the New Statesman. He's the senior editor of politics. He writes about politics, economics, world affairs, and when he's not writing, he tends to be speaking. And you may have seen him on Newsnight and other political programs. Before joining the New Statesman, he worked for Channel 4, and he worked for Sky News. And I understand you're writing a biography of the Labour leader, Ed Miliband, and I, I presume um, all the best bits will be leaked long before publication. Opposing the motion, we have Sir David Richards, a very distinguished diplomat, 30 years service, postings to Baghdad, New York, where you worked on the UN Security Council, Brussels, in 2003, David returned to Baghdad and later became the UK's special representative to Iraq. Your final posting was head, and I have your title here, Head of Defense and Intelligence at the FO. Bob Ayres had a long and distinguished career inside US government. He was Director of Defensive 
information warfare within the Ministry of the Department of Defense from 1990 to 92, and it says here, he was responsible for the security of more than 40,000 classified intelligence processing systems at 55 locations across the world. Are you sure it was only 55 locations, Bob? Douglas Murray is an author and journalist and has recently moved to become assistant director of the Henry Jackson Society. He's also a ubiquitous media commentator and I, I think you were due to be in New York this evening, is that right? So I'm very grateful you rearranged your flight to be with us here this evening. Without further ado, Clayton, can I ask you to come forward and speak? Thanks very much. <clears throat> Actually, one thing I think it might be might quite exciting to do before you speak is who of you here have a view about the motion? So the motion is, this house believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place. So informal voting, but a show of hands, those of you who would support that motion. <laughs> this house believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place. Who would oppose that motion? Relief. <laughs> Only a few of you oppose it, so you've got a lot of work to do to make people change their minds. And which of you have no view at all, wish to abstain for now? It's interesting, so it's as many as those who are opposing. So, um, Clayton, over to you, Thank sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here in London. Good afternoon. Uh, I've been asked to participate because, like my colleagues, I do believe in many of you in the value of whistleblowers. Um, I am speaking on behalf of Al Jazeera's Transparency Unit, and for anything that I say that's wrong, I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> I do believe that whistleblowing is a vital effort in this day and age now more than ever. Uh, we live in a time of unprecedented government secrecy and unprecedented wrongdoing. Added to that, we also have a phenomena of an untoward collusion between the mainstream media organizations and government that have surrendered a lot of the journalistic principles of keeping governments in check and holding them to account, whether it be because of political leanings or they want to get invited to the next Christmas party. I don't know why, but many of you see this in the reporting on television and in newspapers, and it's a distressing trend in this era of journalism. At the very issue of whether or not to support whistleblowers, is the value and the principle of anonymous speech. Now, as I said, I'm representing Al Jazeera, but I'm also an American. And this is something in my country which we have a very rich tradition in anonymous speech, which we took from our British uh, forefathers. It was used at the turn of, uh, at, at the beginning of our country in discussion over the Federalist Papers over what form of constitution the US government would have. People posted anonymously long, lengthy critiques of what a future American government should have. And they did so because they didn't want retaliation. They didn't want people to hurt them for having a public discourse. And time and again, the US Supreme Court in the United States has upheld the value of anonymous speech, recognizing that it, it releases inhibitions, it helps break taboos. And in fact, what's, what's very amusing about the whole criticism of using anonymous speech these days is the fact that governments have nearly perfected anonymous speech. Let me give you a clear example. Um, oftentimes, foreign governments, the United States government, uses the media to help make policies go over well with the public. They message through anonymous sourcing. They go to journalists, and how many times did you see in the run-up to the Iraq war, this senior administration official saying, about WMD or this senior intelligence official speaking to this organization on Saddam's intentions. So when it serves their interests, they have no problem picking up a phone, calling us journalists, and it happens all the time, and making their, and making their passing along their information. Why? Because the powerful can. They make the rules, right? Well, it's the same thing when it's turned on its head, now they attack the leaks and disclosures and the anonymous sourcing, and it's wrong. This is the future of journalism, when we have, as I said in the beginning, the unprecedented wrongdoing and the collusion of so many journalist organizations with these governments. People are finding ways in the digital age of taking massive amounts of information and putting it out on the internet. Now, at Al Jazeera, we recognize that trend, and we set up, in recent months, the transparency unit, because we wanted to have a way to receive these tips 
and to have a channel securely that people could come to us and pass information along if we were not able to obtain that information through traditional investigative journalism. Now, we're not a town crier organization. We don't publish immediate. We take in information, we vet it, we authenticate it, we stand it up, we give it context, we give it nuance, and at TV, our challenge is to turn documents into television that informs the public and helps make better choices to our viewers. We did that with the Palestine Papers back in January. Some of you may have seen it. We partnered with The Guardian. This was our first disclosure, if you will. It was 1,700 documents of secret negotiations between Israelis, Palestinians, and Americans. And it showed the inner workings of a process gone awry since 2000 to 2010. We took a lot of heat for doing it, but we stuck to our guns. And already in the business, we faced our first challenge, which is what to withhold? What don't you put out there? We were under tremendous pressure from the British government. In fact, we fielded calls from MI6 to withhold publication of the name of an alleged MI6 officer who proposed a secret rendition program to take mid-level Hamas operatives and to intern them with EU funding. Now, this is a plan that's illegal under international law. We had a rigorous discussion inside about whether or not we disclose the individual's name. He was listed as a British consul in Jerusalem at the time, and we had multiple sources saying he was, in fact, MI6. And at the end of the day, we said, is, if this was a Libyan intelligence officer, would we withhold his name? No. If he was Venezuelan, would we withhold his name? No. When you get rid of the my country tis of thee objection that journalists often want to have, it's a, it's a liberating feeling. We put the name out there, and guess what? The world kept turning. No one got hurt. The end was not nigh. But what we did in all of our disclosures, where we gave context and information, because if you just put documents out there and you don't, they don't have any, any background to them, people don't really benefit. It's no use in putting a deluge of data if you don't tell people why it matters to them and why they should know about it. And in fact, they probably won't look at it. Now, the critics of my colleague Julian's organization, WikiLeaks, um, many of them are, are journalists. And I I've, I've thought about what they've said about him in particular and, and about WikiLeaks and, and the impact it's had on, on our profession. And I come away with, with two, two thoughts I'd share with you. One is sort of a more basic human critique, which is they're hating on him because he got a scoop they didn't. Okay? If he was an American or if he was from an establishment organization, they'd be talking about what awards they're going to give him. And the editors would be having all sorts of discussions on the appropriateness of what they put out there. And the second point is that a lot of the organizations, to get back to my earlier statement, they don't have the editorial cojones to publish. Okay? This is evidence. Let me take you back to 2004 when the New York Times. Final 30 seconds, please. New York Times came up with, uh, they, they, they found new information that the Bush administration was surreptitiously eavesdropping on U.S. citizens. The Bush administration weighed in on New York Times, got them to delay publication until 2005 after Bush was safely reelected. They also withheld, the Washington Post journalist David Finkel also withheld the Apache helicopter footage that WikiLeaks put out there. Why did he withhold this? The my country tis of thee rationale. The people will know what not to put out there. We see this in Egypt when they go into the Ministry of Interior and they see sex tapes. The people didn't put it out there because it violated privacy. The masses know what's appropriate and what's not to put out there, and so do us journalists, and we should be entrusted with that. Thank you, Clayton. Thank you very much. Speaking against the motion, Sir David. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I think even, even before the vote, uh, the, the preliminary vote, I realized that uh, those of us who've been asked to oppose the motion uh, had got our work cut out, especially in this forum. But anyway, we will do our best. At the risk of making our position worse at the outset, uh, I concede that in certain circumstances, there is a valid case for whistleblowing. When other remedies have failed and there is evidence of illegality or deceit or abuse of power, blowing the whistle can
can be justified. But not everyone who leaks a confidential document, or even 250,000 of them, uh, is entitled to call themselves a whistleblower. Many leak not to expose wrongdoing, but for political advantage, or because they disagree with a particular policy, or because they take the view that governments should not be in the business of keeping information secret. I see this as a problem for WikiLeaks, where genuine examples of whistleblowing are buried in an avalanche of confidential material which shows no abuse at all. I also agree that to hold government to account, the public needs to be properly informed. Most democracies have accepted the need for greater transparency and taken steps to give the public access to more information. In the UK, the passing of the Freedom of Information Act. With rather more government sucking of teeth, the growth of judicial review has also played a huge part in opening up the workings of British government, including, including the most secret. But what I want to argue here is that there are good reasons why governments wish, and indeed are duty bound, to maintain confidentiality in some areas of their work. Freedom of information is not the same as an information free for all, and the right to know does not necessarily mean a right to know everything all of the time. Here it's worth recalling the exemptions built into the Freedom of Information Act. These include national security, defense, international relations, and the formulation of government policy. These categories may be broad, and no doubt too much information is classified, but it is not too difficult to see why our security and defense will often depend on secrecy. Whenever we get on an airplane, we're generally reassured, if mildly irritated, by all, this, by all the searching and baggage checking. But just as important to our safety is the work done by the security and intelligence agencies. Since 9-11, there's been only one terrorist attack in Britain, leading to major loss of life. But those agencies have prevented a number of other attacks, which, in one case at least, would have led to many more casualties than occurred in London on 7-7. The work of these agencies has to be secret. They cannot operate if their sources and methods are exposed to public view. One of the goals of diplomacy is to make the world a safer place. But to be effective, diplomacy too sometimes requires confidentiality. The leak of State Department cables... You said diplomacy requires secrecy as well, and you worked at the UN. Uh, you mentioned WikiLeaks. Do you think the people in this room have the right to know that UN diplomats were being bugged by Americans and that Hillary Clinton said, get every information you can, including their air miles information? Do you think that was right and we should have a right to know that? Well, there's quite a lot I could say about that, not that, but I'll make one very short point here. I, I mean, I thought, frankly, that, that was a little bit absurd. Uh, having worked at the UN, I know that if I, like, if I want information from a UN employee, I go along and ask for it, and that UN employee normally gives me that information plus a cup of tea and a biscuit. So I think they, <laughs> they made fools of themselves over that. I will entirely agree. Um, but I think, I mean, uh, you've picked out probably the only exception. Um, <laughs> the leak of the State Department cables has not shown the US government up to its neck in conspiracies and cover-ups. What has been revealed by and large, is the normal traffic of diplomacy, information that governments wish to keep confidential for the sake of their working relationships with other governments, negotiating with other governments, finding the compromises which are the lifeblood of international relations will always be more difficult if the bargaining process becomes public. At the UN Security Council, resolutions are voted in public. Their texts are public. Explanations of vote are public but the negotiation itself takes place behind closed doors because fewer resolutions would see the light of day if that were not the case. Getting diplomatic context to speak frankly or advisors to give candid advice in the domestic arena depends on trust. When the lead Russian and American negotiators on the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty wanted to find a way through the difficulties they faced, they went for their famous walk in the woods. They may have needed the fresh air, but they also wanted the chance to talk frankly and to build trust. Trust and frank speaking are impossible if confidences and confidentiality cannot be respected. Without frank speaking, 
misunderstandings proliferate and the quality of information on which governments must base their decisions deteriorates. Not, in my view, a recipe for a safer world. There are clearly two conflicting principles locking horns here. The public's need to be properly informed and thus able to hold governments to account, and the government's need to keep some aspects of what it does confidential, to protect its citizens, and to function effectively. There is no simple formula to resolve the conflict, but if the right balance is not being struck, the democratic way to address this is not by whistleblowing, even if, in some exceptional circumstances, it may be justified, still less by wholesale leaking. Instead, we should improve the democratic and constitutional processes by which the executive is held up to scrutiny. Parliament, the media, the courts, the rights enjoyed by individual citizens operating within a framework established by law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. This talk is about not whether sometimes information should be kept secret by those tasked to do so. Of course it should. The question is whether whistleblowers and their actions make the world a safer place or not. Or to rephrase the question, would the absence of whistleblowers make the world a more harmful place. We just heard this last speaker saying that when considering balance between the desire of certain groups and individuals for secrecy and laws that coerce individuals at the point of a gun to keep things secret, and the rights of all of us to know what our government is doing, that, well, this is simply a matter for the courts. This is simply a matter for the democratic process. This is something to be ironed out between us and cast into law. But I ask you, how are we going to know if the secrecy process is working or not? because when information is concealed, we do not know about it. The only way we can know whether information is legitimately kept secret is when it is revealed. All systems of censorship have that problem encoded within them. And because of that original sin of censorship, they all must be held to outside account. The way that has been traditionally done is by courageous individuals who are privy to information that they believe the public is interested in, squirrelling it out, often at very substantial personal risk, to the public. And the public then, if the media, which it rarely is, if the media is an honest conduit, the public then decides whether to support those actions or not. So perhaps we should talk about some of those actions because if we're not talking about what actually happens in the world, what are we talking about? We are talking about myths that exist in our own heads and hypotheticals. So I want to look at some situations in history that have led to war and perhaps have stopped war. Because a war between peoples certainly does not make the world a safer place. And the absence of a war or the prevention of a war must surely be the ultimate in making people safer. The Vietnam War was triggered by the Gulf of Tonkin incident. A lie about 
a boat off the coast, a US boat off the coast of Vietnam, which the United States government claimed had been attacked by the Vietnamese. That claim was a lie. And there were people privy to that claim at the time who knew it was a lie and have come forth in the last 10 years to talk about how it was a lie. But if they had come forth, if they had broken generals' interpretations of what national security secrets are, as the alleged whistleblower Bradley Manning is alleged to have done, then that war may have never have happened. Similarly, the disaster that has been the Iraq war, we all found out about doctored evidence and dodgy dossiers, but when did we fi find out? We found out after the war had already started and the bloodbath that was Iraq was in full flight. Why did we find out after? Was there no one concerned in the planning who felt that it was wrong? Of course there were. But the fear that these individuals had, the fear of being imprisoned and jailed for revealing that information to you, kept them secret until later on in the process, much later on. And this year in Great Britain, we are seeing somewhat of an inquiry into that process. The Chilcot Inquiry. But recall that WikiLeaks released a cable on the Chilcot Inquiry with the head or chief of defense of the MOD telling the US ambassador at the time that the inquiry was being set up, don't worry, we're going to protect all your interests here. Similarly, there was a time in 2007 when there were serious moves afoot to get up a war with Iran. Most of you in this room will probably remember that feeling and that time when Bush's neocons were pushing daily through their mouthpiece in the United States and in Great Britain for that war. People like Daniel Ellsberg came forth and said, do not do what I did. Daniel Ellsberg was the leaker of the Pentagon Papers. Do not do what I did and wait four or five years until after the Vietnam War had started. Do not wait, come forth before this war starts and stop it. Sources did come forth to Cyhurst. Sources who saw the planning for that war in the Pentagon. And as a result, there were moves against it. Those sources have not been caught. They have not been exposed. They did their best. They may have changed history. And they went back to their jobs and continued on. It is that latter model that we want to promote as much as possible. Whistleblowers face difficulties. Although it is rare that they end up in prison, they certainly often lose their jobs and their employment prospects. But when they can speak anonymously, they can change history and feel proud of themselves and their act and continue on. In 2008, we got hold of the Iraqi, uh, sorry, the US military's classified rules of engagement for Iraq, the rules that the US Army and its air support have to use when conducting battles in Iraq. And we worked with the New York Times to get that out because one section of it spoke about how the US military could cross over into the border of Iran without senior authorization at the commander level when chasing someone in a battle or a suspected terrorist or a number of other situations. But most wars 
have started as a result of border disputes of one person crossing over, one soldier crossing over into another country's territory. And in a way, you can see the, goal, the alleged fabricated Gulf of Tonkin incident as one of those cases. The Iranian Foreign Ministry held a press conference and said that this was unacceptable. And later on, we got hold of another copy of those rules of engagement. From 2008, some months after that publication, and the rules had changed so that US soldiers were not permitted to cross over into Iran. I could speak for hours about what has occurred in Cablegate and all the tremendous revelations that have happened there. Just yesterday, the editor of the Hindu, the most respected paper in India, bought over 21 front pages from the past six weeks that were based on Cablegate material. The Indian parliament has walked out four times and there is now a tremendous anti-corruption movement that has been building up in that country, something that hasn't happened since the time of Gandhi. Coming to the final minute, Julian. The final minute. So I say to you, of course, it is obvious that whistleblowers make the world a safer place. And when we try to look at the counter-arguments, we see hot air. It doesn't mean that everything in government should be exposed. What it does mean is that the system of breaking alleged laws is working. And that must be kept going that way. Otherwise, laws cannot reflect the reality that we are in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, Bob Ayres. When I saw the show of hands at the beginning, I uh, realized what the Christians felt like in the Colosseum. <laughs> Don't worry, they're a gentle bunch. Yes, yes. Uh, just a, a point of clarification. Uh, the Vietnam War was well underway before the Gulf of Tonkin incident. That was under the administration of Lyndon Johnson, and the war started under John F. Kennedy's administration. So your timing was a little off, Julian. Rather than you address want to come back, Julian, on that? specific... Well, I'll come back to that. As you well know, the French were involved in that war for many, many years. The US was also involved in swirling things in many ways, this. but the can point of escalation... Reject. Reject. I reject it. I reject it. Sit down. Sit down. Always reject. Thank you very much. Please continue, Bob Ayers. Thank you, thank you. We were very polite when he spoke, and I expect the same courtesy from him. Obviously, I'm wrong. Please allow Bob a hearing. What I'd like to talk about is not uh, the specifics of how many documents were compromised or who said what to who. What I'd like to look at is how we, as individuals and as organizations and as groups of people, deal with issues of secrecy. Secrecy is something that we have all experienced throughout our history, and there's various forms this takes. We have religious secrets, as evidenced by the Gnostics, by some of the Mithrians, and by the Knights Templar. We have social secrets, such as the Freemasons and the Knights of Pythias. We have commercial secrets, trade secrets, intellectual property, commercial and confidence material. And we have criminal secrets. The mafia has a secret code. And lastly, we have state secrets. All of these organizations have a commonality on how they deal with those secrets. One is the organization professes to hold knowledge that is known only to members within the organization. Members in that organization are expected to take an oath or make a promise to retain the secrecy of that information. And lastly, the members 
accept and acknowledge that they will be punished for the revelation of that information. And this is common across all those groups. It's not anything unique to the state. As people, we have developed a very rich language and nomenclature that describes people who reveal secrets. We call them a snitch, a rat, a squealer, a traitor, or a whistleblower. These are not terms I've invented. These are terms that we have invented as a society to describe these people who reveal these secrets. When we try to address the motivation for revealing secrets, we find it's very... Yes? As someone who worked in government also as a federal criminal investigator, just to clarify, we also called snitches people who came to us to rat on their friends or to provide information to the government. So the pejorative term you're using, we also use to define people who supplied us with information. And the rationale for people who break this, this oath or this promise to retain the secrecy of documents is as varied as some of the things we've heard here already today. People break their oath for greed, money, advantage. They break their oath for revenge. They break their oath based on ideology, fear, or ego. There's a, a wide range of punishments that we put in place for people that break their oath, and depending on the organizational group you're in, those punishments vary. If it's a religious group you're in, you can be excommunicated for violating your oath of secrecy for the religious secrets in the organization that, to which you belong. Socially, you can be expelled from the group. Commercially, as Julian said, you can be fired, or even worse, you can be subjected to a civil suit. Criminals can be put to death, especially if you rat on the mafia. And the state can put you in prison, or in some cases, put you to death for violating your oath to protect information. People that break that oath we remember them, and we remember them in a bad light. If you're British, and I say the words Burgess, McLean, Philby, Blunt, you know they were spies who gave British secrets to the Russians. If you're an American, and I say Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen, you know those were men who violated their oath and gave secrets to the Russians. If you're a Russian, and I use the name Oleg Pinkovsky, you know he's the man that betrayed the motherland and gave secrets to the Americans. And if I say Joe Valachi, and you're in the mafia, you know Valachi is the man who testified against your organization and was later sentenced to death. So today we're discussing the, the legalities and tech, technicalities of whistleblowing. At least that's what the motion is before us. I think we've gone beyond that. What is interesting is this motion before us, it really avoids some of the basic human characteristics that should be shaping this discussion. Humans appear to share this belief that people that betray their oath are something that extends across cultures, it extends across societies, it extends across continents. People that break their oath are someone that we revile, and we distrust. The question before us, at least the unspoken question before us, is do individuals or organizations who encourage us to break that oath or facilitate our breaking of that oath or promote us breaking that oath, are they just as guilty as the person who breaches the oath himself? Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I think actually this evening we have some actual whistleblowers in the audience, and I'd like them to come forward to say a few words. Um, Annie Machon, please come forward. And Paul Moore. Annie, if you stand there. Paul, if you could come to speak at this. 
and he is a former British security service, I think MI5, intelligence officer, who left the service at the same time as David Shaler, who many of you will remember, her partner at the time, to help him blow the whistle about criminality within the intelligence service agencies as he saw it. Annie, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and also tell us a little bit about your own story? Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. I just have a few minutes. Uh, two points of information. First of all, if you're an intelligence officer within any of the UK intelligence agencies, you do not uh, swear an oath. You do not do any of that sort of thing. So slightly different from the American system. And second uh, point of information, everything I say now has already been cleared. So if anyone behind me is reaching for their speed dial to special branch police, there is no need, I can assure you, gentlemen. <laughs> I, jo <laughs> I joined MI5 in the early 1990s along with my ex-colleague and ex-partner, David Shaler. We both worked as intelligence officers. During our recruitment there, we were told repeatedly that MI5 now had to obey the law. They'd been put on a legal footing for the first time in 1989. So it's a bit of a shock during our six years there that we saw such a cascade of incompetence and criminality that we felt compelled to leave and compelled to go public in order to try and affect some sort of change. And that list of incompetence and criminality included files on government ministers and a whole range of other prominent individuals in the UK. It included illegal phone taps, IRA bombs that could and should have been prevented, which actually exploded on UK streets. Um, and then MI5 colluding in the cover-up about their mistakes in the run-up in those operations. It also included two innocent Palestinians who were convicted wrongfully of an explosion outside the Israeli embassy in London in 1994, who were sentenced to 20 years each, and I believe they still rot in prison. And it came to a, a zenith in 1996, when David was officially briefed about uh, an MI6-funded plot to try and assassinate Colonel Gaddafi of Libya. And in this case, MI6 was funding a bunch of Islamic, or Islamic extremists or Islamist rebels. Now, I suppose the only difference between then and now, how the years change things, is that, of course, now they're funding Islamist rebels, but they're doing it more openly. We all know about it. <laughs> anyway, what to do? We hadn't signed up to the agencies to collude in that sort of activity. We joined up to serve our country and try and make a difference. Now, in the UK, under the Official Secrets Act, there is a clear, bright line against disclosure, which means you can't go to anybody apart from the head of the agency which has committed the crime in order to report the crime. You can't even go to your MP or to the police legally under the terms of 1-1 of the OSA. So what to do? We decided, after many sleepless nights, to go public, to go to the press, and to hope that the ensuing um, furore would enable an inquiry, would pile on the pressure for an inquiry into this incompetence and criminality. This meant that we had to literally go on the run around Europe. We ended up living in hiding for a year in France, and we ended up living in exile for another two years outside the UK. We had to stand by and watch as friends and family, as student supporters and even journalists were arrested and in some cases convicted because they dared to expose these crimes, to help expose these crimes. And, of course, David went to prison, not once, but twice. First of all, in 1998, when the British government failed to extradite him from France. And secondly, after he had returned voluntarily to stand trial under the Official Secrets Act, and he was convicted and went to prison in 2002. But in fact, what happened that was worse was the way his reputation was ruined in the press, through spin and through media manipulation. And why does this happen? Because you would think that the fourth estate would hold the spies to account. Whereas, in fact, they are very easily controlled by both the government and the intelligence agencies, not only through the Defence and Security Advisory Committee, which is a sort of media self-censorship committee, used to be known as the D-Notice Committee, but through the application of the Official Secrets Act, through the application of libel laws, through the application even of terrorism acts, well, terrorism laws. And we also see as well, there's a section in MI6 called information, minute, Annie, information Operations, which spins and controls media um, news as well. So, of course, if we lived in an ideal world where we had transparency and the respect for human rights and freedom of information and an ethical foreign policy, we wouldn't need the press to um, continue to support whistleblowers or you know, even to do their duty to support whistleblowers. But we don't. We live in the real world of this nebulous war on terror of illegal wars in the Middle East and the erosion of our civil liberties. And we need some sort of channel to protect whistleblowers 
And at the moment, we don't have that legal channel. I suggest that we do need one in the laws of this land. But until we do, we have WikiLeaks. And they provide protection to the whistleblowers, rather than allowing the poor whistleblowers to be persecuted and prosecuted. So I say thank you very much to WikiLeaks. And I hope they continue their work for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Before I um, introduce Paul Moore, does I wonder if anyone opposing the motion wishes to come back um, on that, on some of the points? And he spoke about criminality within MI5, incompetence, plots to assassinate Gaddafi. Does anyone wish to talk about that? Come back on any of the points you raised? Douglas? Douglas Murray. Well, can I just ask Ms. Macken if you ever signed the Official Secrets Act? Well, thank you. Uh, you try to present to this audience the idea that you don't have to have some kind of silence or secrecy if you're going to engage in the secret service. It would seem to me inherent in the name that if you join the secret intelligence <laughs> services, you can keep secrets. Sadly, you and your friend David Shaler showed you couldn't. And, and what's more, by the way, if I may say so, Ms. Macken, um, since on. leaving the uh, security services, you've made a career as a 9-11 truther, 9-11 conspiracy theorist. And I saw you and Mr. Shaler testify before Lord Savile a few years ago, that one time I've seen you having to speak on oath, and you were the shortest witnesses that that inquiry in its 13 years ever heard, because you didn't have anything to say, and because you came pretending you had secrets, and it became clear you didn't know anything. You were very low level, and you go around the world trying to present yourself as an expert in this area. You didn't know anything. You were in the services for a short time. You broke an act you signed, and now you try to present yourself as a free speech expert. It's laughable. Thank you, Douglas. I think, I think on this occasion... Well, can I, will I just allow, make two uh, very Annie, quick points? can I just points. check one thing? The pronunciation of your name, the French, Machon. Machon, yes. Okay. So it'd be nice if you get even um, that right. Could you please come back on that? Briefly, though. Briefly, I must... Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, the evidence we gave to the Savile inquiry was about a fake um, agent called Infliction, and we ensured that the evidence given by MI5 officers about this source was changed because of our evidence, so that was one thing. We signed the Official Secrets Act to protect official secrets, not to protect crimes. And actually, whatever level we worked on... <laughs> And whatever level we worked on, I'd say we probably know a damn sight more than someone who has never worked on the inside at all as an intelligence officer. So, thanks for your informed comments. Thank you, Annie, for that um, robust intervention. Um, <laughs> Paul Moore, um, tell us a little bit about your experiences at HBOS, from where I, I believe you were dismissed for warning HBOS and others about the extent of that reckless bank's overexposure and risks. So please tell us a little bit more. Again, I'd like to hear your story, what happened to you, and what the consequences were. And maybe for four to five minutes, please. Yes. Um, you may think that blowing the whistle on a bank has nothing to do with death, but it does. <laughs> the banking crisis has driven 100 million people into poverty and killed many millions of those people. So it does have something to do with death. I say one thing to Bob. Dwight Eisenhower once said, never confuse honest dissent with disloyal subversion. There is a fundamental difference between people who raise and speak truth to power from a position of ethical decency and those who are doing it for subversion. I'm very pleased... <laughs> Hague lifts the lid on Britain's secret past. Times front page today. We're a government that believes in transparency and openness. It is what people expect, and it is what they have a right to. Transparency is the key to truth. Anything done in the dark is not nearly always the truth. And it is the truth that sets us free. We only grow by taking risks. And the biggest risk we ever have is being honest with ourselves and others. 
But this above all, to thine own self be true, for then it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not be false to any man. Of course, obviously, proper whistleblowing makes the world a safer place. It prevents disasters. It prevents wars. On a micro basis, it removes people from organizations who are criminals or doing civil wrongdoing. And on a macro basis, it leads to major change of policy process, and transparency leads to a better world. In my case, I'm glad to say, after I was fired by James Crosby for trying to slow down Halifax Bank of Scotland, that it has led to some changes, some good changes, some protections for chief risk officers. I haven't got sufficient time to go through some of these things. But there's not nearly enough change that's come out of it. And the, and the principal reason for doing what I did was to drive change in the policy so that we can be protected from the way the banks work. We have not done nearly enough about it. We're still not doing transparency on it. There's never been a proper inquiry because if you did a proper inquiry, the vested interests would be found out. The vested interests of governments, uh, regulators, accountants, rating agencies, etc. In fact, we're thinking of driving a mass movement to get the transparency around this because, mark my words, if we don't solve it this time, the next time it will be a wipeout, a complete wipeout. And many academics are saying it and Mervyn King's saying it. Actually, I'd like to blow this whistle on the format of this particular event. How can you have an event of this nature and not have a whistleblower standing up here on the stage and being allowed to speak for the proposition? I was given this. I was sent this whistle by an anonymous admirer, and on the side of it, it says, in Latin, it is sweet and honorable to speak up on behalf of the fatherland. Paul, now, whist minute, no, excuse me. Whistleblowing. <laughs> Paul, whistle you, have, you have one minute. Whistleblowing may make the world a safer place, but it doesn't make it a safe place for a whistleblower, and we've got to do something about it. You get treated like toxic waste. You get treated like a leper. You care more about the organization, and then they rubbish you. I'm going to read you something very personal. I have, been in, I have been in the depths of... Sheol over this. This is my son writing a card to me on my birthday, on my birthday when I was in the depths of suicide, suicide around this. I know that you think this birthday stuff is nonsense, but it is a day to celebrate your life and what a great person you are. Know this, that everyone has flaws and I like to look past those flaws to the good person. And there is a lot of good in you and a lot more than you give yourself credit for. I am truly proud of you and everything you stand for, which is mainly integrity and truth. But don't worry, because actually we get transformed by truth. And the reality is that you get transformed by trouble. So all the pain and suffering has been worthwhile. And if you want to ask anybody how it changes from a, the valley of death to amazing grace, ask my lovely daughter, Emily, who's in the audience tonight, and she will tell you. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you very much. So Paul was blowing the whistle there, but that was very, very poignant words in, in that card. Thank you very much. Um, we've had many questions through our website for this event. And what, what one, Julian, which seemed to recur again and again, was this idea of collateral damage, um, putting innocent people at risk as a result of whistleblowing or leaking valuable information. Um, do you have a view on that? It'd be very good, interesting to hear you on that, please. There's so many people wanted to hear you speak on that. Well, I, I have a view on it. Um, we have been in the business uh, for about four and a half years now of exposing actual collateral damage. The deaths added up uh, in total of over 140,000 people documented case by case uh, in the case of the US military 
and assassinations uh, from Kenya uh, to East Timor. So that's actual, not only collateral damage, actual murder. Now, if we speak about WikiLeaks, there has been a lot of hot air said about our publications by the Pentagon and its supporters, and in fact by the press constantly since World War II, at least, um, about anything that the press publishes that embarrasses the national security sector. But the facts are these. We have a perfect record in two respects. It is not perhaps a record that we can keep forever, but to date, we have never released a document that was misdescribed. We have never got it wrong, ever, that anyone alleges. And no one has ever come to physical harm as a direct result of anything that we have published. So that's the answer. And that's what uh, Gates, uh, the um, Defence Secretary of the United States, admits. It's what NATO admits. It's what the Pentagon has admitted on a constant basis. But if you Google for the phrase blood on hands and WikiLeaks and compare it to blood on hands and Pentagon without WikiLeaks, you see there are 10 times as many references to WikiLeaks and blood on hands as there are to Pentagon and blood on hands, including all the wars that the Pentagon has ever done everywhere. So go away and think about that and think about how is it that an organisation whose opponents say that it has no blood on its hands, but there is some hypothetical risk that everyone should be talking about, has managed to produce 10 times as much history embedded in news pages about its opponent having blood on its hands when it has none. Thank you. I'm very keen to keep this debate as balanced as possible, and I would very much like to hear from um, Douglas Murray. I'd like you to come forward now. I felt we need a, a long peroration from you. Uh, on which particular Whichever subject? Whichever you want to say. Um, do you want me to preempt my speech? Yes, please. Give you, I'd like you to deliver your speech, okay. actually. Uh, okay, very well. Well, are you I'll come sure? Back. I'll come back to you. Sorry. Uh, um, I'm worried about how, how one-sided... I'm worried about it, too, coming. but we, we can... Is there anything? We can... <laughs> do you want to say anything now? No, I, I'm, I'm happy to hold. I'd like to hear maybe. Okay, all right. Thank you. Mehdi Hassan, please step forward. Everyone's been waiting for you. I'm worried about how one-sided it is too. I know Paul's been whistling away, but Paul, there's about five of us on our side and three on their side. And by the way, Paul, I've been to countless debates on fox hunting and there were no foxes on the panel at all. But um, I'm joking with you, Paul, I'm joking. I don't want to talk about, uh, I don't want to talk about WikiLeaks. There's too much WikiLeaks stuff, Julian, with respect. I don't want to talk about Julian. I don't want to talk about me. I don't want to talk about Paul. I don't want to talk about Philby, Burgess, and McLean. I want to talk about a man named Joe Darby. Joe Darby was a, uh, Joe Darby is a high school graduate from small town Pennsylvania who joined the US Army Reserves at the age of 19 and was posted to Iraq at the age of 24. In January 2004, completely by chance, he was accidentally given two CDs containing hundreds of photos taken by US military guards at a small prison called Abu Ghraib. Darby switched on his computer, put the CDs in. He saw Iraqi prisoners hooded, gagged, forced to perform sex acts on each other with electrical wires tied to their genitals being threatened with dogs, being attacked, sodomized, raped. The US investigating officer, Antony Taguba, said those pictures showed torture, abuse, rape, every indecency. By handing over those CDs to the US investigating officer, Joe Darby, to use the lingo of the military, or to use Bob's language, ratted on his friends, on his fellow soldiers. And when he ratted on them, 
He was immediately in fear for his life because they weren't arrested, those guys. They wandered around the base with weapons. He went to sleep with a pistol under his pillow. When he went back home to see his wife, he was told that they had to sell their house and move town because it was no longer safe to live there anymore. He had to be followed around by six armed bodyguards for six months. He eventually quit the military, all because he decided to blow the whistle, because he helped us, the rest of the world, uncover one of the worst crimes perpetrated by the US military abroad in recent years, and there are a lot to choose from. <laughs> Darby, Darby was asked, Darby was asked by CNN's Anderson Cooper in an interview, do you wish it wasn't you who had been given the CDs? He said no, because if they had been given to somebody else, they might not have been reported. Would that have been a bad thing, said Anderson Cooper, to which Darby replied, they say ignorance is bliss, but to actually know what they were doing, you can't stand by and let that happen. You can't stand by and let that happen, ladies and gentlemen. That is what whistleblowing is all about. And that is why it is so important. And if the opposition side want to argue today that whistleblowers don't make the world a safer place, that they risk lives rather than save lives, instead of pulling out ancient examples from history about spies, perhaps they should all book a ticket, fly to Baghdad, and tell the inmates of Abu Ghraib prison that whistleblowers don't matter. They have no impact on the world. They don't make the society we live in a safer place. I would like them to go and talk to those people and say Joe Darby shouldn't have blown the whistle. He shouldn't have come forward. He shouldn't have spoken out. Whistleblowers perform these invaluable life-saving tasks in many occasions. And remember, Let's be very clear, and Bob's coming, I'll take your point in one second, I just want to clarify before you make your point. Bob goes on and on about traitors. Traitors, spies who went to the Soviet Union and sold secrets. I'm not sure which dictionary Bob uses, that is not a whistleblower. I'm not here to defend spies, I'm not here to defend leakers. I'm here to defend people who speak out against dangerous, dishonest, or illegal activities. That's who I'm here for. Who are you here for, Bob? I'm, I'm here to be entertained by some of the speakers this evening. Uh, Not you, but carry on. <laughs> Allow Bob to have the, his point of order, please. The, uh, the comparison of the man who turned over the CDs of Abu Ghraib and a person who violates an oath to secrecy is a very different thing. The man who turned over those CDs, he had no oath that he was breaking. He had no responsibility to an organization to keep silent he behaved in a way he should. And for you to compare that with someone who swears to retain a secret and then breaks that oath is wrong. Well, thank you very much for that point. I'm not sure, that I, I don't, I'm not sure we ever came along to debate, uh, have a debate about people who swear oaths and then break secrets. I thought we were having a debate about whistleblowers and I believe Joe Darby is a whistleblower and is proud of being a whistleblower. Paul, with it or without your whistle, I'm not gonna let you in. Um, but listen, this is a debate about people this is, continue, people, this is a debate about people, this is a debate about people, it's not, and actually Paul's there, Paul didn't take any oaths to protect H. This is not about oaths, this is not about swearing little uh, secrets or signing documents. This is about people who speak out, as I said, very clearly, very clear definition, people who speak out against dangerous, dishonest, illegal activities. And it's not just about politics and governments, let's be very clear, it's about big business and corporations too, for example. Take Jeffrey Wigand, who was vice president of Brown and Williams and the US tobacco company, portrayed by a rather pot-bellied Russell Crowe in the film The Insider. He was, he was, he raised the alarm over the, over the nicotine that was used by his company. He was fired, he was harassed, his children's lives were threatened, but he saved lives by becoming a whistleblower because Brown and Williamson were then forced by the US government to reduce the carcinogenic ingredients in their cigarettes. On his evidence, there was a $236 billion case against big tobacco. The US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, said Dr. Wigand's assistance was central, central to the FDA's investigation into the role and effect of nicotine in tobacco products. I don't know, Bob, whether Jeffrey Wigand stood and put his hand up when he joined Brown Williamson, but he saw that they were killing kids and he spoke out and thanks to him, again, our world is a safer place. Now, in a perfect world, of course, we wouldn't need whistleblowers. We wouldn't want whistleblowers. But, <laughs> surprise, surprise, we don't live in a work perfect world. Shock horror. We live in a very imperfect world where our governments and others lie to us repeatedly. They engage in corrupt backroom deals. They break the law at home and abroad. And then they demand our trust. Our trust. 
year after year after year, lie after lie after lie, and then they say, well, you don't need whistleblowers. Well, stop lying to us, and we won't have any whistleblowers. <laughs> Show me a government. Show me a government, democratic or undemocratic, Western or non-Western, which hasn't been involved in cover-ups or abuses of power of some shape or form. I remember John Reid, the Labour Minister, telling me, trust me, trust me, I've seen the intelligence. The weapons are there. The weapons weren't there. Sir David spoke very eloquently. Sir David was working in the Foreign Office when his boss, Jack Straw, was going around to Downing Street to say, and I quote, the case for war against Saddam is thin. If only, as Julian pointed out, we'd had some whistleblowers back in 2002, 2003, who instead of going to chat with Andrew Gilligan in a bar, had come and told all of us, the public, about those dodgy dossiers and those weapons of mass distraction. We would have hundreds of thousands of innocent Iraqis still alive today, had we had those whistleblowers then. And, and in an imperfect world, in an imperfect world, we need whistleblowers. In an imperfect world, we need whistleblowers until perhaps a day will come when governments and intelligence agencies and media apologists will own up to the level of deceit, dishonesty, corruption, and cover-ups in our public life. And just to conclude, if you want any more evidence of the import and influence of whistleblowers, just look what happens to whistleblowers. If you want to know who's on the right and who's on the wrong, just look what happens to the people who blow the whistle, especially on their own government. Look at Daniel Ellsberg, Final who was prosecuted, seconds, threatened, and blackmailed by the Nixon administration, which wanted to have him, quote, incapacitated. Mordecai Vanunu was held by the Israelis for 11 years in solitary confinement. He's still not allowed to own a mobile phone or access the internet. And Bradley Manning, of course, is being held right now by the Obama administration in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day where his underwear is taken from him before he's allowed to go to sleep at night. And I'm amazed that people on the right are so fearful of whistleblowers. The same people who go on about the big state, big government, evil bureaucrats. And yet when whistleblowers come along to put power in our hands, the people's hands, they get all worked up and say, this is outrageous, this is wrong, this is going to destroy the world. No, whistleblowers empower us all by exposing the truth. And brave people like Joe Darby, Jeffrey Wigand, dare I say, private first class Bradley Manning, make the world a safer place. For their sake, not for my sake or Julian Assange's sake, for their sake, I urge you to back the motion and I beg to propose. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mehdi Hassan, senior politics editor of the New Statesman. Um, we're entering the home stretch here now, 10, 15 minutes to go. It's a question here, Clayton, I'd be interested for you to answer. Um, Jerry Metcalf has asked it. He says, whistleblower organizations may become a powerful tool to control the government, but who is going to control those organizations? Who controls the whistleblowers? And how can we know that the information that they publish is not being manipulated? I think the short answer to that is the public. The public holds us journalists to account, and I think the public takes in on whether material submitted anonymously is done to impugn someone, is done to defame, is done to conceal an agenda. I think all of what we heard really doesn't give enough credit to the common man and woman that they can take in information that's submitted anonymously and make their own opinions and evaluate it and determine whether or not this is information being put out there to spun or to strike some other agenda or if it's to legitimately call someone out on wrongdoing. I think there needs to be a broader conversation on how journalists, whether it's Al Jazeera, whether it's WikiLeaks, whether it's any news organization who, who touches and takes in this information about what we put out and what we don't put out. I think those conversations are taking place, for example, you know, I, I in, my own, uh, in my own opinion, I don't think that it would be good to put out information related to critical, critical infrastructure vulnerability. I don't think that the public would be better served to know. Um, so, uh, so absolute openness you don't support? I don't, and I don't think journalism does that. Journalism, we do have some context, some background, some nuance. We don't just vomit information without 
vetting it, thinking about is what WikiLeaks is... WikiLeaks just vomiting information, or does it need media partners to... I think earlier you spoke about context and information. Well, I'll let, I'll let Julian speak for WikiLeaks, but what my, my observation has been is, is that WikiLeaks has partnered with a number of organizations that have, and, and to WikiLeaks' credit, it has allowed a diversity of views on the subject. He's not monopolizing it, nor did Al Jazeera with the Palestine Papers. We partnered with The Guardian, because sometimes there's information that's just too important for one news organization to have, and it would just be too obvious for someone to say, Al Jazeera, you didn't put out everything, or you spun it, or, or Guardian. You, so when you, when you partner, I think you get, you get more accountability and you get more safeguards. But I think that the short answer is, this is, a new, this is a new type of journalism. There does need to be some sort of code of ethics and standards, and I think as, is, as, a, as a new form of journalism, it's being worked out. And I think the proof's in the pudding, and that's why it's so popular. And I think that's why this man was voted by Time Magazine one of the most popular figures in the world, because he's brought in and added to the global discussion over what governments are doing behind closed doors in their names. Thank you, Clay. <laughs> Douglas Murray, could you please step forward? Thank you. <laughs> well, um... Well, thank you very much. Um, I've been trying to get you on all, all evening. I, I know. I, I, uh, I was never going to give up the pr pleasure of being last in the running order, not least <laughs> because it allows me to disagree with some of, my, uh, some of the previous speakers and also to agree with them. Um, I, I'm sorry to enter a note of boring uh, bipartisanship here, but I, I agree with Mehdi. Um, it is perfectly true that democracies and democratic governments can be, and in most cases are at some point, uh, dishonest. And yes, they can be corrupt. This is true. Democracy is a deeply flawed system. Uh, it isn't at all perfect. It's not perfect any more than the world is perfect. It is, as Churchill said, the worst system going apart from all of the others. <laughs> and I think we have to be aware, very aware in this discussion, of the difference between open societies, democracies, in which evils can come to the fore, and do, and those systems in which they never do, and cannot. Are there flaws in our governments? Of course. Flaws in our systems? Of course. But, by and large, a democracy like Britain, a democracy like America, has a lot of checks and balances along the way. Different departments, different officials, different Parties coming to power, elections, elections every few years, elections which have just thrown out the government that Mehdi was critical of over Iraq, and I suspect will soon throw out the current government here, um, <laughs> making your biography a biography possibly terrifyingly of the Prime Minister. Um, all of these things are true, but who knows what we should know? Who decides? Well, leakers and people like Mr. Assange, and let's just be clear tonight, after all, we have Mr. Assange on the panel, so it is likely we're going to be talking about WikiLeaks and leaning in that direction in this debate, decide they know what you should know. They can tell you. But do they know, ladies and gentlemen, what they're doing? It's very, very easy indeed. I'm a journalist, so I spend a lot of my time doing it, and it is very easy to criticize government when it goes wrong. It's also enjoyable. But Allow governments... Me to continue, please. To some extent, not perfectly, tend to know what they're doing. Do the leakers, do WikiLeaks know what they're doing? My own personal feeling is this, that when you unleash thousands and thousands of documents that were never meant for the public eye, were never meant for your opponent's eyes, were never meant for foreign intelligence agencies' eyes, you introduce an element of chaos. It's like war. It's very hard to contain once you start it. You may think you know what you're doing. You may think that you're going to lead to great criticism of the American government. But what about the collateral damage in your campaign? Are you sure you know what you're doing when you release secret uh, uh, documents relaying secret conversations between, say, the fragile government of the Yemen or Jordan or a conversation with the king of Saudi Arabia saying that he hopes the Israelis do bomb Iran? Are you sure you know what you're doing when you introduce 
an element of chaos like that into a region which I can assure you doesn't need more conspiracy theories. Miss Macken, uh, Miss Maschen, I'm so sorry, I'll get it right at some point, uh, talked about with great pride of her release of the information that MI6 were looking at trying to assassinate Colonel Gaddafi. Are you sure that it was a good idea that you let Colonel Gaddafi know that? No. Uh, no. I'll, you'll get that. I'm going to ask you quite a lot of questions, so you'll get a chance. No, 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 no. No, you'll get a chance to answer my questions in a minute, Mr. Assange, when I finish Very good. speaking. Continue on. Miss Machen said that she knew she was proud of the Gaddafi thing. Are we sure that it was a good idea to let Colonel Gaddafi know 10 years ago that MI6 had been looking at, uh, at uh, doing that to him? You can sit down. You're going to have time, I can tell you. Um, is Mr. Assange sure? So, so you're rejecting Is Mr. The interjection. Assange sure? Are you rejecting sure? the interjection? No. Yes, of he's, course I'm in rejecting, rejecting the interjection because I'm trying to, will be time because I'm trying to get there will be through time. my speech. There will be time. Please. Is Mr. Assange sure that he has read through all of these documents and knows better than foreign intelligence agencies what they are likely to draw from them? Maybe he does. Maybe he is indeed the godlike figure such a person would have to be. What about aimed leaks after all? This new era of journalism, this new era of journalism, it strikes me it's very like the old one. People get to pursue their interests. If they hate America, they can release a whole load of stuff that they want to make uh, America look bad in the world. If, like Al Jazeera, you're implacably hostile to the state of Israel, you can release information which you think, no, 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 you'll get your time to. <laughs> You'll get an opportunity to, patient, sit, to sit in, your, in the state of Qatar, not exactly an open democratic government, <laughs> and release as many papers as you can that you think will show the state of Israel in a bad light, very much like the old journalism, very much like it. Are you sure, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that these new advocates of all this freedom and openness are really as brave as they present themselves? Clayton had a lovely line earlier, by the way. I'll do it for you. He said, he said that after releasing the Palestine papers, I can almost not keep a straight face, we took a lot of heat for doing it. I'm amazed you're here, Clayton. Mady said, what happens to whistleblowers? Well, it appears, if Mr. Assange is anything to go by, it's a lovely life. You can make a lot of money, you can get a lot of admirers, you can present yourself as a great advocate of something you don't understand entirely, and you can pack out a hall in four uh, hours. Now, finally, no, no, no. Douglas, finally. you surely have to take one. No, 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 no. You surely have They're to take no, one. No, 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 they're going to get a moment. Look, there are states in the world today, there are states in the world today which really are hostile, which really do kill journalists. I can't help noticing that WikiLeaks and these other organizations don't go for them. Why has the Russian government's secrets not come out? Is it because the FSB... Is it because... No, no, no. Is it because the FSB actually kills journalists? Actually does it? Doesn't give them platforms? No, no. Sit down and be quiet. One sec. Please, no shouting from the floor. Point of information. Douglas has accepted it. Julian Assange. I have had colleagues in Kenya involved with us in exposing some 500 extrajudicial assassinations in that country in the last three years, who themselves have been assassinated. So I would ask you to please do your research before making comments like that. Well, Mr. Assange, you don't seem to be that bothered. If I can say so, um, the most respected Guardian uh, journalist, Nick Davies, relayed the conversation with you about Afghans when he said he, that you had said they are informants. If they get Point killed, they got it coming to them. Point it of seems order. to me that we you're pretty suing. free with people's lives. We are lives. in the process of suing the Guardian in relation to that comment. Perhaps Nick you would Davies like to didn't join say the queue. You can sue Nick Davies and the Guardian. It's not I'm Nick really Davies, really it's David, David Lee. Lee. Oh, one second. We don't if want to I get generate to a slangy match between the purview. And Mr. Science can Perhaps you would seat. like to speak to Der Spiegel, who was also at the meeting and has their own view of those events, which are precisely counter to what you were saying. Julian, should an advocate of Nick, the Open Society be using finish. libel laws to sue newspapers? Lies have no social utility. The truth has a social utility. 
The abuse of libel laws is a terrible thing. That is why I was involved in constructing the world's strongest legislation oh. in Iceland to protect us all from the abuse of libel laws and have campaigned constantly here in the UK. But actual lies by powerful organisations that abuse the size of their megaphone in an industry must have a recourse. And that recourse is in the courts and the court of public opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, can I continue? One second. No, no, I will not you. tolerate any more points of information. I would like Douglas to be able to finish his speech. Please go ahead, Douglas. I, I think I read from that that Mr. Sange thinks that libel law is good when he's using it. Um, as I said, I very much look forward to WikiLeaks revealing the full extent of the Russian Secret Service's killing of journalists. It doesn't seem to me right that at a, a meeting organized by a journalists club, we don't raise this fact. The fact is that the CIA doesn't hunt down and kill its critics. The FSB does, and I'd love to see that reflected a little more in your work. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan said that by and large, uh, he'd noticed as a diplomat throughout his life that that complaints of human rights abuses happened in exactly inverse proportion to the human rights abuses in a country. That the more you were able to hear about them, the less likely it was that they were going on, precisely because in closed societies you don't hear these stories. I would love it if these new organizations did blow the whistle on these, but I just note that they don't. Finally, democracies, as I said at the very beginning, are imperfect things, but the best things going. They have to, among other things, including elected representatives, have to answer questions. They have to answer questions. Sometimes those questions are unpleasant. They have to be answered. And when they're not answered, you and I, the public, get to throw out the politicians that we no longer trust, and we do. So those people who are very critical like Mr. Assange, of the workings of these governments, should perhaps answer some questions themselves. And since we have the opportunity here tonight, and you'll allow me a little run at this, and then you can come back, Mr. Assange. I'd like you to answer a couple of questions. You are, after all, a, an organization dedicated to uh, freedom of information. Who funds WikiLeaks? Are you willing to reveal all of your sources of funding. How can you demand transparency from governments when you as an organization have no transparency yourselves? Who works for you? Who are you involved with? Who are your employees? Where are you even based? None of these things get answered. Let's have some more questions. What's your connection with Israel Shamir, the Russian nationalist and Holocaust denier who says he was an employee of yours? Furthermore, what gives you the right to decide what should be known to the public and what should not? Governments are elected. You, Mr. Assange, are not. Finally, who guards the guardians? Or in this case, who guards the guardians' guardians? <laughs> it seems to me that WikiLeaks is and will continue to be a very unsatisfactory place to do this from. I'm finishing with this. Ian Hislop relayed a couple of months ago in private eye a telephone conversation with you. He said that in the course of that telephone conversation, you said that there was a conspiracy led by Guardian journalists against you, which included David Lee, the editor Alan Rusbridger, and John Kampfner from Index on Censorship, all of whom you said Doctor, are, quote, Jewish. And then when you realized that Mr. Rusbridger is not Jewish, you said, well, sort of Jewish. <laughs> I would like to know I'm whether... I'm off the point. I'm, I'm coming back to the point, I can assure you. I would just like to know... All the rest of your attributes aside, Mr. Assange, somebody who has gone so far into the fever swamps of conspiracy theory, whether you are really better placed than any government to decide what these ladies and gentlemen and I and all of us can know. Thank you. Douglas Murray, Assistant Director of the Henry Jackson Society, newly appointed. Um, we've run out of time, but Julian, after those final statements or allegations from Douglas, would you like to come back and say anything very briefly? Julian Assange, very briefly to conclude the debate. Well, obviously, Mr. Murray 
has nothing to say about the motion here tonight. Since he has resorted, like so many of that type, to personal attacks on me and our organisation, which are, of course, unfounded, and which I hesitate to respond to directly because I perceive them to be a corruption of what we are all here for. But I cannot let some of them go without comment. The most interesting of your views is about who decides whether a media group or organisation should be supported or not. I think that is an interesting question. And the answer in our case is you decide. We are a publishing organisation and we publish the works of whistleblowers. We publish it to the world and the world is interested in what we do. All the fruits of our labour are visible to the public because that is the type of labour that we are engaged in. Unlike organisations which are supported by oil or by politically resting money out of the tax base or by advertisers, we are directly supported on a week-to-week -week basis by you. You vote with your wallets every week if you believe that us facilitating whistleblowing is a worthwhile endeavour, or not, if you believe that it's not. If you believe we have erred, you do not support us, and if you believe we need to be protected in our work, you keep us strong. That dynamic feedback between us, whistleblowers, and the public, I say, is more responsive in a government structure that is elected after sourcing money from big business once every four years. <laughs> Just to confirm that. Douglas, one second. Thank you, Julian. I will allow one final point of information and then we will close the debate. Very quickly, have you never received any money from anyone other than the individuals of the general public? And two, you have just confirmed to us, you think you're better than our government. It's you that's meant to speak for us. Thank you. Then the lady there has done the job. Then your fawning clack have done the job for you. Thank you, Douglas Murray. Um, I asked earlier, at the beginning of the debate, for your position. I remind you of what this motion was again. This house believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place. I know, I know Julian has to go for obvious reasons, but one second. Who believes, this house believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place? What is your position on that now? It's roughly the same, maybe fewer. Um, who is against the motion? Anyone abstaining? This house believes whistleblowers make the world a safer place. I'd just like to say thank you very much to Ryan Gallagher of the Frontline Club. Thank you to Adam Bowie of the New Statesman for all their organizational works. Thank you again to Jemima Khan for her wonderful guest editor of the New Statesman, which you can all buy outside. And thank you for being such a good audience. Thank you very much.